Hello and welcome to The Space Above Us, episode 59, Skylab 4 Part 1, In for the Long Haul. Last time, we covered the second half of the record-breaking and pace-setting mission Skylab 3. The second crewed mission to America's first space station, Skylab 3 raised the bar on the quality and quantity of work that could be performed in space. Their 59 days on orbit were record-setting at the time, but still short enough that they were able to sprint for the finish line, skipping over 70% of their scheduled free time in the process. They had exceeded their goals, but was such a pace sustainable? With their safe return, we would soon find out on the one Skylab mission remaining, Skylab 4. In fact, we almost found out sooner than expected. Decisions involving rockets need to be made far in advance, months before the launch. Partway through Skylab 3, things weren't looking quite as rosy for the orbital outpost, with frequent intervention by the crew to maintain systems. There was concern that if a problem arose during a lengthy, uncrewed time between flights, the impact of the problem could be amplified. With that in mind, a plan was considered where Skylab 4 would launch and then dock on the radial docking port of the MDA, while Skylab 3 was still attached to the main docking port. If I understand correctly, the crews would never actually meet, but by ensuring the safe arrival of Skylab 4 before the departure of Skylab 3, the downtime between flights would be eliminated. It was a cool idea, but as the flight progressed, there was less and less concern about Skylab systems, and the rescue mission turned out to not be required, so the crew hot swap became less appealing. Plus, there was a good reason to push the launch down the road by a month or two, something none of the original mission planners saw coming. Thousands and thousands of years ago, a grubby snowball began a long freefall towards a distant point of light. That distant point of light was the sun, and the grubby snowball was eventually known as Comet Kohoutek. Comets actually whiz through the inner solar system more often than you might expect, but they typically aren't discovered until one of several sun-observing spacecraft notice them explode in a blaze of glory as they succumb to the intense solar heat. Finding a comet while it's still far from the sun is less common. So, it was fortuitous that on March 7th, 1973, just two months before Skylab's launch, a Czech astronomer named Lubos Kohutek noticed something moving in the sky. The comet that would bear his name was not expected to reach perihelion, or the low point of its solar orbit, until late December. Not nearly enough time to launch a new spacecraft or develop a new instrument, but plenty of time to prepare a Skylab crew to make observations. And the comet looked like it could be a doozy. By studying its orbit, scientists estimated that it had a similar mass to the spectacular Halley's Comet. They were also pretty sure that this was its first trip close to the sun. As such, they expected all sorts of ancient volatile gases would be shed by the comet, leading to a brilliant light show and a great scientific opportunity. Studying the gases streaming from the main comet body, using the appropriate instruments, would allow scientists to gain a lot of insight into what comets are made of. And since the theory was that comets such as this one have been lurking around the periphery of the solar system since its formation, that meant we could learn a lot about the early solar system as well. The chance for astronauts to study a comet from orbit was just too good to turn down especially after Apollo 13 was unable to study Comet Bennett due to something involving a faulty oxygen tank or something. I don't really know the details, but it really knocked them off schedule. By delaying the Skylab 4 launch until November, the crew would have a chance to observe the comet before and after perihelion. So, November it was. Skylab 4 would be the first all-rookie NASA flight since Gemini 8, seven years earlier, when a stuck attitude control thruster tried to kill Neil Armstrong and David Scott. The Skylab 4 crew wasn't completely green, though. The commander and pilot had been in tentative training for Apollo 19, and all three had been putting in their dues as support crew members. Flying in the left seat as commander was Jerry Carr. Gerald Carr was born on August 22, 1932, in Denver, Colorado. Carr definitely falls into our test pilot mold for astronaut backgrounds. When he was 17, he joined the Navy's ROTC program before studying at the University of Southern California. When he graduated, he joined the Marines, who taught him how to fly. 
He served in two all-weather fighting squadrons, flying a variety of aircraft, including the F-9, the F-6A, the F-8, and a bunch of other Fs. He also gained experience flying ground-effect vehicles, which are those crazy things that look like airplanes flying 10 feet off the water. Look them up, they're nuts. Ground-effect vehicles. Anyway, he was hard at work as a test pilot for the Marines when NASA came calling in 1966, where he joined 18 of his colleagues as part of Astronaut Group 5. This was his first and only spaceflight. Flying in the center seat as science pilot was Ed Gibson. Edward Gibson was born on November 8, 1936 in Buffalo, New York. Gibson is definitely not from the test pilot mold, but was instead one of the scientist astronauts. He got his educational career rolling with a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Rochester, right down the road from Buffalo. From there, he earned a master's and PhD in engineering from the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech. As part of his work, he studied plasma physics and jet propulsion, two fields that were highly relevant to his future stint on Skylab. He was working as a senior research scientist when NASA scooped him up in astronaut group 4. In either a prescient or lucky move, he wrote a textbook about solar physics during his early time at NASA, making him an easy pick for the heliophysics-oriented Skylab flight. This was his first and only spaceflight. And last but not least was our pilot, Bill Pogue. William Pogue was born on January 23, 1930 in Okama, Oklahoma. Bill Pogue was a pilot through and through. He had been with the Air Force since 1951 and flew in assignments as diverse as combat fighter-bomber missions as well as the Air Demonstration Squadron, the Thunderbirds. When he wasn't flying one of the 50 types of aircraft he was proficient in, Pogue could be found putting his master's degree in mathematics to use as an assistant professor in the U.S. Air Force Academy. He joined NASA along with Jerry Carr as part of Astronaut Group 5, and after serving on the support crews for Apollos 7, 11, and 14, I think he was ready for his time in the hot seat. This was, wait for it, his first and only spaceflight. As you may have noticed, all three of these rookies would count this mission as their one and only spaceflight. And we'll get into this later, but if they could only pick one, this one certainly gave them a bang for their buck. After the successful 28-day flight of Skylab 2, and even more successful 59-day flight of Skylab 3, NASA was ready to push the limits. Though officially only cleared for 56 days, or 59 depending on the final orbit, this was the same deal as Skylab 3, the crew would be granted weekly extensions up to 84 days. Each week, the state of the spacecraft, onboard supplies, and the crew's physical condition would be evaluated, and assuming that all were doing fine, they'd be given the green light for another 7 days. Fun fact, that works out to about 100 orbits. Despite a rough ride to orbit and all sorts of unplanned EVAs, their destination was doing pretty well. The impromptu thermal shield was holding up just fine, as were the control moment gyros, which kept the station pointed in the proper direction without using thruster fuel. Things were mostly fine on the consumables front as well. Skylab's wild first 10 days in orbit chewed through a lot of attitude control fuel, leaving only 37% or so left, but that was plenty. Water, oxygen, and nitrogen were all good, and with a little topping off, the food should be no problem. The same could not be said about their launch vehicle. The launch vehicle known as SA-208, which we can decode as the 8th Saturn 1B rocket to carry an Apollo spacecraft, was having some trouble. First, some small cracks were found in a load-bearing beam on the first stage. Next, some heavy rain indirectly caused a bizarre incident with the propellant tanks. With bad weather rolling in, covers were placed over some vents on the launch vehicle. During a propellant load test, these covers were sucked into their vents, which prevented pressure equalization, and the fuel tank dome buckled. Rather than canceling the flight so they could rebuild the tank from scratch, engineers, very carefully I presume, re-inflated the tank like a giant metal balloon. Yikes! After double-checking with x-rays and special dyes and stuff, they confirmed it was good to go. But SA-208 had one last fun surprise... More cracks. This time in the eight fins at the base of the rocket. I guess you can't really blame it. The rocket had been sitting around for eight years or so waiting to fly. 
and had also spent some time on the pad already in case Skylab 3 needed to be rescued. The fins were removed and replaced one at a time, resting on the other seven. They were later tested and it turns out that they were just fine, but, you know, better safe than sorry. Plus, NASA didn't want to look like they weren't taking safety seriously by flying with cracked rocket fins. When November 16th, 1973 arrived, the crew climbed into the elevator at Launch Complex 39B and stepped out onto the crew access arm over 320 feet above the Florida coast. You may be wondering, why was the crew 320 feet up if the Saturn 1B is only about 220 feet tall? That's due to a feature that I have criminally neglected over these last two missions just because I couldn't find a natural way to work it in. Now I'm just shoehorning it in. The Saturn V was 363 feet tall, with its little sister, the Saturn 1B, coming up about 140 feet short. So how do you launch a Saturn 1B from a launch pad designed for the Saturn V? You make it taller. Thus the practical, clever, and completely ridiculous looking solution that came to be known as the Milk Stool was born. Do yourself a favor and do an image search for NASA Milk Stool and try to contain your laughter. This was literally just a giant metal lattice stool for the Saturn 1B to stand on, allowing the same umbilical arms as the Saturn V to be used. I've always felt bad for the four Saturn 1Bs that launched from the milk stool since they are pretty huge rockets in their own right, but on top of their little stand, they look like toys. Oh well. The crew climbed aboard their spacecraft along with a special camera for observing the comet, actually the backup of that hydrogen camera from Apollo 16, and 150 pounds of extra food. Things were tight enough that some vibration padding was replaced by the crew's extra clothes, a move anyone who's tried to get away without checking a bag can relate to. At 9.01 a.m. Eastern Time, the eight H-1 engines at the base of the S-1B stage ignited, and Skylab 4 was on its way. Ascent and orbital insertion were uneventful, with the command and service module being deposited into a 150 by 227 kilometer orbit. And yes, I know I keep switching between metric and imperial units, Welcome to being an American who works in engineering. Within eight hours, the crew had sighted their target, rendezvoused, and docked. Though docking did take a half hour longer than expected when the first two attempts didn't take. It seemed Carr was a little too gentle in guiding the CSM and the mechanism didn't fully engage. But don't worry, we're almost done with this ridiculous docking mechanism. While some lessons take a while to sink in at NASA, one thing that had gotten through was that the crew might need some special handling to prevent space adaptation syndrome, or space sickness. Since it was believed that the disorientation of flying around in large spaces was a contributing factor, the first night in space would be spent in the CSM. That way the crew could start adapting before being exposed to the cavernous orbital workshop. It was a good idea, and maybe it helped, but not enough. Bill Pogue wasn't feeling great and eventually vomited. This is somewhat ironic from a guy who used to perform in the Thunderbirds doing all sorts of stomach-inverting stunts in front of audiences all around the world. In fact, Carr's stomach would soon join Pogue's in feeling queasy over the next few days, leaving Gibson untouched. You know, the guy who learned to fly after becoming an astronaut? This incident would not be a huge deal, except the crew did a pretty dumb thing. They were concerned that Mission Control might overreact to Pogue's upset stomach. But in addition to Houston, also on their minds was Washington, D.C. NASA was in the midst of preparing for the space shuttle era, which involved a fair amount of wrangling for money in Congress. The last thing this crew wanted to do was give space shuttle opponents more ammunition to shoot down the nascent program. They didn't want people asking how shuttle commanders were going to pull off their one-shot, no-backup landings if they were holding a barf bag in one hand. So they talked it over and decided not to say anything. They thought about never mentioning it ever and destroying the vomit bag, but I think the plan they landed on was to mention it only after the flight, in private. Unfortunately, there was a tape recorder running. I'm not actually totally sure what this was used for, but the CSM was equipped with a data voice recorder, which transmitted its recordings when convenient. From there, technicians would transcribe it, I think to help with incident analysis or just whatever. 
That night, the voice recordings were transcribed, red flags were raised, and Mission Control was not happy. The next day, Alan Shepard himself got on the radio to confront the crew and make sure they didn't destroy the sample. The crew admitted they had acted with poor judgment. It was not a great start to what would prove to be a rocky air-to-ground relationship. As the crew left the CSM and entered Skylab proper the next day, they were in for a surprise. I mentioned last time that the Skylab 3 crew left a dummy in the form of a flight suit stuffed with clothes on the ergometer, and it turns out they also left two others all around the station. What's funny is the crew was so busy they didn't really have time to put them away for a while, so they were just floating there, creeping on them. They were so busy that almost immediately the crew began to slip behind schedule. They just couldn't complete their objectives in time, and the ground began to push harder and harder. The crew worked their butts off to keep up, but the relationship between those in space and those on the ground began to groan under the weight of their schedule obligations. The schedule did not seem sustainable, but nothing was changing. There were a few factors going on here. First, as we're now well aware, it takes time to ramp up to being in space. The crew, especially the space-sick Carr and Pogue, had to take it slow, but even Gibson was feeling it. The crew compared this period to the acclimation period of a prolonged stay at high altitude with similar effects. Even when they didn't feel sick, they had less stamina, getting tired sooner. They also found themselves getting hungry faster. This is something that passes with time, but that doesn't make things any better during the adaptation period. Second, this was clearly a lived-in spacecraft. I'm sure the previous crews were diligent in their tidiness, but with three guys, a tight schedule, and no gravity, things were going to get lost. Items, books, procedures, food, all these things just weren't where they were supposed to be from time to time. At one point, Jack Lausma, who was mowing his lawn at the time, got a call from Mission Control, relaying a question from Orbit about where he left something. I wonder how many people can say they got a call from space while mowing the lawn. Third, there were training inadequacies. This one always surprises me given how much time astronauts spend training, but there's also a lot to learn. The crew found that there were many tasks that they had barely touched upon or had simply not trained for at all. Of course, these took longer than expected. This crew especially were impacted by available training resources just due to the nature of the beast. The Skylab 4 crew had to wait for the Skylab 3 crew to be done with the training equipment, who had to wait for Skylab 2, who had to wait for the end of the lunar landing missions. There were only so many full fidelity simulators available, even at NASA, and they all had a line. Fourth, Earthbound Expectations. There are a lot of factors that contributed to schedule slip, but I think this is probably the biggest. For Mission Control, this was their third stint on Skylab. They had seen it all. Crazy seat-of-your-pants attitude determination, unplanned spacewalks, thruster failures, spiders, solar flares, you name it. But for the crew, this was their first. And somehow the ground forgot that. By the end of Skylab 3, the crew and mission control were working together like they'd been born doing this. Every day flowed smoothly and things were getting done at a clip that would have been thought unimaginable beforehand. But then they went home and Mission Control forgot that Skylab 3 had to earn that efficiency the hard way. They expected Carr, Gibson, and Pogue to slot right in and continue on at the same pace. Which was crazy, that's just not how this works. The crew needed time to find their footing, and then to ramp up their efficiency over several weeks. And lastly, though not really lastly since there's always a million factors, crew stoicism. This one might seem like a weird one, but stick with me. The crew knew they were slipping, but no one ever really came out and said, no, wait, something's wrong. They gritted their teeth, shortened their tempers, and got on with the job. I think part of this is just the kind of personality that the role of astronaut attracts, but I also think they had this attitude of, you know, this is their big moment. They've been training for years and waiting for longer than that. They weren't going to admit what they perceived as defeat and say, I can't do this. When in a way, that was really their job. Yes, the ground expected them to work their butts off, but the pressure caused them to rush, which caused them to make mistakes, which caused more pressure. No one was in a better position to recognize the situation for what it was more than the people who were living it, and none of them raised their hand, at least at first. <laughs> 
I didn't really intend for that to be so litany-like, but the friction between the crew, the ground, and the schedule came to define the first half of the mission and to a large extent its place in spaceflight history. While the crew struggled with schedule pressure, they were still getting stuff done. Lots of it. As you'll recall, partway through Skylab 3, the airlock coolant system developed a leak. The primary loop needed to be topped off if they wanted to perform any more EVAs. Of course, it wasn't designed to be serviced during the mission, so once again, engineers had to get clever. At the end of the day, the fix was pretty simple. Using a mechanism called a saddle valve, the coolant loop was punctured with a tight seal preventing leaks, and additional coolant was inserted. But it was important that the mechanism and procedure be properly vetted. For one thing, the coolant loop was key to doing EVAs, so it had to work. For another, if something went wrong, it would spray coolant all over the place in zero gravity, which would make a mess, and I'm pretty sure it was at least mildly toxic. Also, fun fact, the coolant in question was called Coolanol, which sounds like a drink someone made up. On day four, the coolant loop was refilled, and it remained functional for the rest of the mission. Which is good, because on mission day seven, November 22nd, 1973, better known as Thanksgiving here in the States, Skylab 4 performed its first EVA. Remember how I mentioned Skylab was starting to feel more lived in? Yeah, I'm sure the crew weren't thrilled when they discovered mildew growing inside their EVA suits. A little scrub down and time to dry fixed that, though. Once their suits were clean, Ed Gibson and Bill Pogue clambered out into the void to perform a routine ATM film swap run and repair an antenna that was part of an EREP experiment. The antenna fix was actually a little tricky since, you guessed it, the device was not designed to be serviced in space. From what I understand, the antenna's gimbling mechanism was acting up, and engineers suspected a short in the system. Gibson anchored his feet on the structure and held Pogue's legs as he opened the antenna control mechanism. Once inside, Pogue isolated the problem to a short with the pitch controls and locked it in place. Better to not move at all than to move erratically, I guess. After six and a half hours outside, Pogue and Gibson came back in. If you're curious if the Skylab astronauts got turkey for their Thanksgiving dinner, science pilot Ed Gibson did. Commander Jerry Carr had prime rib, and pilot Bill Pogue had chicken and gravy. One of the ways the crew made up some extra time was by trimming some of the usual activities that didn't really seem to be worth it anymore. Remember the lower body negative pressure experiment and that crazy nausea inducing chair used to study the vestibular system? I didn't really drive this one home, but these weren't one off experiments. Each would be repeated by various crew members every few days. Again, the idea was to see if there was a change over time as the crew adapted to space. More experimental runs meant more data, and more data meant more reliable results. The thing was, it didn't really seem to be paying off anymore. Out of the nine astronauts to live in Skylab, five of them suffered from space adaptation syndrome, but it seemed that once they adapted, they were almost impervious to motion sickness. They could sit in the spinning chair of the vestibular experiment forever with no trouble, so that was just becoming a waste of time. And when it came to the lower body negative pressure device, from what I understand, they just weren't seeing a rapid enough change to justify doing it as often as they were. Plus, it was pretty unpleasant. Especially earlier in the mission, the crew would often experience pre-syncope, which in English means they almost fainted. Since this wasn't uncommon, each run actually took two people, one to be in the device and one to monitor the test subject. They had to pay pretty close attention too, since there weren't any sort of readouts on how the test subject was doing. One of the crew's recommendations when they returned was that future experiments of this type needed better displays, Stuff like an EKG, so they could better understand what was happening. So with these two experiments taking a lot of time and not providing the best return, the number of times they were run was shaved down a bit. One little anecdote that stood out to me was both pretty funny but also illustrative of the schedule pressure everyone was feeling. It wasn't uncommon for Mission Control to send up a few just-one-more-thing requests after the crew had their dinner and were winding down for bed. But it turns out it occasionally happened afterwards, too. Sometimes a crew member might leave his quarters during the sleep period. Early in the flight, they weren't the most adept at moving smoothly in zero gravity, so if a mission controller kept a close eye on the rate gyros, the instruments that indicated which way Skylab was pointed, 
They could actually see the slight disturbance of the crew member moving around the station and know that someone was awake. What a perfect chance to radio up a quick task to complete. Just a few minutes, you'll hardly notice. It didn't take long for the crew to improve their microgravity sneaking. Time flies in low Earth orbit, and before they knew it, 40 days had passed. Christmas had arrived on Skylab, and the crew scrambled together a Christmas tree of sorts out of random stuff they had on board. The exercise made them realize just how little color variety was in their little home away from home, something they specifically mentioned should be improved upon for future long-duration flights. But it also meant that the day of EVA-2 had arrived. Kamakahutek was making its closest pass to the sun in just a few days, so this was the perfect time to record the before of a before and after. So far, the comet had failed to deliver on the promise of Halley-esque spectacle, but it was still visible and still a valuable scientific target. So Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue suited up and headed outside. The main objectives of this spacewalk were a standard run up the ATM for a film swap, as well as observations of the comet. Observations were made with a few instruments, including temporarily mounting a camera to the Skylab structure in order to take long exposures of the somewhat dim heavenly body. At 7 hours and 1 minute, it became the longest orbit-based spacewalk up to that point. The Apollo J missions each had lunar EVAs that lasted a little longer, but clearly NASA was starting to explore the limits of how long a zero-gravity spacewalk could be. As Carr and Pogue buttoned up the airlock module hatch, they knew it wouldn't be closed for long. Comets move pretty fast near perihelion, so a second comet-based EVA was planned in just a few days when the comet came flying back around the sun. In the meantime, it would be back to slogging through the ever-growing backlog of objectives relayed by the ground. They were 40 days down, but the end still wasn't really in sight. They still had 75% of the duration of Skylab 3 to complete, and the pressure was really starting to get to them. The crew was becoming increasingly testy with the ground, insisted on actually taking some of their rest days instead of working through them like the previous two crews, and were starting to get more and more fed up. It was enough to make an astronaut think about just stopping for a while to catch his breath. I mean, they were up there, and Houston was a world away. What were they going to do? Come up and stop them? Yeah, why not just turn off the radio, shelve the experiments, and just stare out the window for a while? Yeah, that sounds pretty nice. Hmm, a crew disobeying orders and doing what they wanted instead. I think there's a word for that concept. Mutiny. You may have even heard of the so-called Skylab Mutiny. And here's the thing, though. It never actually happened. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.